Hey everybody, welcome. Just want to finish this week up with, uh, you know, talking about the devil. And, you know, a lot of times it's always about how we're, we're behind the eight ball, you know, we're not, we're not doing the right things, the devil's working us, you know. You know, but it's also the other side. We have to be ready that when things are going right, when, when our relationship with God is strong and we're aware of of the way God is working in our lives, the devil's going to try to still come in and try to shake you up, you know. And it may not be sins of the flesh, but it could be sins of the mind. And I think how the devil works is, you know, after you've defeated him in the obvious way, and put away the sinful life. That life itself, time itself, will start to weigh on us. And and it's the doubts. You know, we believe in something we haven't seen. We believe in something for the most part we couldn't touch, feel, examine. And uh, that's faith, trust, okay, in the Greek. So, so in that faith, you know, we'll have a tendency to doubt, okay? I'm just being honest. And, you know, whether I, you know, do I doubt my salvation? No. Okay? But to, to sort of fall away from the zealousness that's required, from the, the intense adherence to the Word and to follow the Word... I mean, the reason I do these videos is to ensure that I'm putting God's work first, and that I'm, and that I'm, uh, I'm doing something to show God an obedience and a willingness to study His Word. Okay, and the reason these videos are so long is because they're not long enough. Okay. And I'd like to think it should be convenient that you can get six minutes and, you know, the, I, I like the 60 second, the Parsha in 60 seconds, because the Parsha in 60 seconds is a cool little way to remind me of where we're at in Torah. And uh, and it's funny, you know, sometimes the, the, the visuals. And, and in 60 seconds, I sort of get an overview of, of what this week's Parsha is going to be about. And then I go to Temple on Saturday, and I get the hour version but it's not enough. It's not enough. So, for those who, who feel the videos are too long, I don't know what to say. For those of you who watch them over and over again, as long as they are, wow. That's cool. So, Am I getting on anybody? No. I'm just putting it out there. You know, I had an English teacher tell me, how long does it, I asked her, how long do we have to write the paper? Because she would never tell us. And her answer was the same every time. Long enough to say what you need to say. And that's sort of where I'm at with it. Do I plan on them being an hour long? No. I prepare a study. I get the get the scripture together, and I and I go over it, and I read it, and then boom, and I put it out there, and they're you know, fifty minutes long, fifty seven minutes long, forty. You know, my my digital recorder will die after a, an hour and five minutes, so I know they're never that long, but they're close. So uh, that's that. I'll stop talking, but um, just want to let you know, those of you who are with it, watching them to the end, wow. Thank you so much. And if they're too long, you know, I apologize. But then again, um, what what better do you have to do? What's better than this time we're spending? Yeah, maybe it's me. Maybe you don't want to spend an hour with hearing me. But the point is, you need to be putting this time in some way, some kind of way. you got to give God some kind of way. And for, for the 30 or 40 people that are in this every day, God bless you guys. You know what I mean? Not because you're watching me, but because you're choosing to put an hour of your day before the Lord and then go off and, 
and, and do what you do for God or do what you do for yourselves, but at least we're committed to this time. Okay, I've said enough. Um, so finishing up on this whole thing about Satan, and we're going to talk about him till, till the last day, trust me, but when the times are good, when things are going right, when your relationship's right with God, the devil's going to come in and he's going to try to slip you up, so be careful, okay? I want to talk today about uh, King David and the Chronicles. I'm going to read a lot. I'm going to talk very little, maybe. Um, so, let's just get into it, okay? Heavenly Father, pray for courage, wisdom, discernment, that the Spirit is with us, working with us, to bring out your word, Father, as we study and grow and learn. And we pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach in the Ruach HaKodesh. Amen. Okay? It's real simple. That's all we're seeking. You know, when we study, that's all we want is a little more wisdom, a little more courage, a little more uh, strength in our faith. Okay? So we're going to Chronicles. And uh, we know the story of King David. He was chosen, you know, the youngest son of Jesse. By a prophet came and Jesse put up his biggest son and said, Hey, how about this one? He goes, It's not that one. Nope, it's not that one. And then the little the youngest kid comes in and he's that one. God knows his heart. That's the one. And so David, who was a shepherd, you know, goes out to defeat a giant, a half breed, a hybrid, you know, a remnant of the the off the offspring of the fallen angels and the and the daughters of man. And uh, he, he, he destroys this giant and then delivers Israel from the Philistines, okay? And, and God was behind that. So David, from the beginning, knew the power of God. Yet David constantly fell short. And um, at, his, at his height of his reign, okay, when things are going good, he was at war with a lot of countries and a lot of peoples and nations, and he was defeating them. And as we'll see, you know, Satan ain't no joke, okay? So we, we pick it up, the story of David in 1 Chronicles 17, 1, okay? And David is the king, and he's, and he's, and he's, things are going well, Israel's, you know, Israel's where it's at, and, and uh, they're not without their enemies, as we'll see, but... First Chronicles 17, verse 1. And it came to pass when David dwelt in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord dwelleth under curtains, under a tent. And Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up Israel unto this day, but have gone from tent to tent, and from tabernacle to another. In all places wherein I have walked among all Israel, spoke I a word with any of the judges of Israel, whom I commanded to feed my people, saying, Why have ye not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus shalt say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the heavenly armies, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following the sheep, that thou shouldest be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thee. And I will make thee a name like unto the name of the great ones that are in the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place, and be disquieted no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more as, as that the first." even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will subdue all thine enemies. Moreover, I tell thee that the Lord will build thee a house. Okay? And it shall come to pass, when thy days are fulfilled, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will set up thy seed after thee, who shall be of, the son, of thy sons, and, and I will establish his kingdom. The prophet is going to tell David, I'm with you. I've always been with you. And I will destroy all of your enemies. And your kingdom isn't going to fail because after you, 
I will raise up your son's kingdom. God tells him this. I will always be with you. We will conquer everybody. This is what he's been told, okay? And this is what he needs to believe. Okay? And 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 I will set up thy seed after thee who shall be of thy sons and I will establish his kingdom. A promise. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him for a father and he shall be to me for a son and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever. This is a promise. According to these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that thou hast brought me thus far? And this was a small thing in thine eyes, O God, but thou hast spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come, and hast regarded me after the manner of a man of high degree, O Lord God, O Yehoah Elohim. What can David say yet more unto thee concerning the honor which is done to thy servant? For thou knowest thy servant, O Lord, O Yehoah, for thy servant's sake, and according to thine own heart, hast thou wrought all this greatness to make known all these great things? O Lord, there is none like thee, neither is there any God beside thee, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like thy people Israel, a nation one in the earth, whom God went to redeem unto himself for a people, and to make thee a name by great and tremendous things, in driving out nations from before thy people, whom thou didst redeem out of Egypt. For thy people Israel didst thou make thine own people forever, and thou, Lord, becamest their God, and thou, Yehoah, becamest their Elohim. And now, O Yehoah, O Lord, let the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house be established forever, and do as thou hast spoken. What? Continue to defeat everybody in the name of in the name of the children of Israel, in the name of God, with the power of God. Continue to bless me and 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 hold true your promise that out of my seed will come a kingdom that will reign forever, and that out of my seed will be a king who will build you a house. David is acknowledging this, okay? First Chronicles 17.25 For thou, O my God, hast revealed to thy servant that thou wilt build him a house. Therefore hath thy servant taken heart to pray before thee. And now, O Lord, thou alone art God, and hast promised this good thing unto thy servant. And now it hath pleased thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. For thou, O Lord, hast blessed, and so let thy servant be blessed forever. David is in agreement. Okay, he's in total agreement. All right, 18. And after this came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and its towns out of the hand of the Philistines. And he smote Moab, and the Moabites became servants to David and brought presents. And David smote Hadrezer, king of Zobah by Hamath, as he went to establish his dominion at the river Euphrates. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven thousand horsemen and twenty thousand footmen. And David huffed all the chariot horses, but reserved of them for a hundred chariots. Okay, and when the Arameans of Damascus came to Sakur Hadrezer, king of Zobah, David smote of the Arameans two and twenty thousand men. Okay, and this word smote as he struck them, he beat them. Okay, beat them down. Then David put garrisons in Aram, Damascus, and the Arameans became servants to David and brought presents, and the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went, as promised. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadrezer and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Tibha and from Kun, cities of Hadrezar, David took very much brass, wherewith Solomon made the brazen sea and the pillars and the vessels of brass. Okay, a foreshadowing to who, you know, David had all this loot. David had all kinds of riches that he took from these countries. He had them stockpiled. And when Tau, king of Hamath, heard that David had smitten all the hosts of Hadrezar, king of Zobah, he sent Hadaram, his son, to king David to salute him and to bless him, because because he had fought against Hadrazar and smitten him, for Hadrazar had wars with Tau. 
and he had with him all manner of vessels of gold and silver and brass. And so they were paying David, going, look, we're your friends. Take all of this. Okay? He was our enemy. You conquered our enemy. We are down for you. Take this, take this payment. These also King David dedicated to the Lord with the silver and the gold that he carried away from all the nations, from Edom and from Moab and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines and from Amalek. Moreover, Abishai, the son of Zariah, smote of the Edomites in the valley of Salt 18,000. And he put garrisons in Edom and all the Edomites became servants to David. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went, as promised. Wherever he went, as promised. And David reigned over all Israel, and he executed justice and righteousness unto all his people. And Joab, and Joab the son of Zariah, was over the host, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahalud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Abimelech, the son of Abathar, were priests. Okay, look at this. Uh... The Zadok, uh, Melchizedek, Zadok, that's the priesthoods, okay, were priests, and Shavshah was scribe, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Sherathites, and the Pelethites, and the sons of David were chief about the king. Okay, David's setting up this vast kingdom, and it came to pass after this that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, died, and his son reigned in his stead. And David said, I will show kindness unto Hanun, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me, and paid me, okay, and worshipped the God, okay, and they, they basically submitted to Israel. So David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father, and David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon to Hanun to comfort him. But the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanun, Thinkest thou that David doth honor thy father, that he hath sent comforters unto thee? Are not his servants come unto thee to search, and to overthrow, and to spy out the land? That's not how David operated. David wanted your stuff. He was going to come and take it. Okay? But this is how the devil starts to work. Okay? So he, they're, they're speaking, these princes, you know, whoever they are, they're rulers. Uh, these are the Tsar, a head person. Okay? So these aren't angels. These are princes. These are just rulers. These are leaders in the community. Okay? Of the children of Ammon said to Hanun, Think he came to honor thy father? The, he sent spies. These are spies. And now the devil starts to work. And Hanan took David's servants and shaved off their beards and cut up their garments in the middle, showing their butts. Okay? They were bottomless. Okay? Even to their hips and sent them away, disgraced. Because they're men of God, they have their beards and they're not cutting them, okay? And 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 like those uh what was in the news, it was the uh the, the Amish that they went and shaved off their beards to disgrace them. This is a form of disgrace because they're growing their beards, they're separating themselves from God, um from from the world. Okay, that's one of the ways you can tell that somebody just doesn't care about the world is that they let their beards grow and they become a, a visual, uh, whatever you want to call it. You know, you should see some of the looks. Anyway, it's not about, it's about, they, 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 they shamed them and sent them with their, with their, with their private parts exposed. Like they had to be embarrassed wherever they went. Okay. Until they got back, sent them away. Then there went certain persons and told David how the men were served, and he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly ashamed. They were sad, man. And the king said, Tarry at Jericho until your beards be grown, and then return. You know what I mean? He knew that they were ashamed, and he wanted to give them, hey, just rest there. You know, live there. You have my blessing. Let your beards grow back out, and then you get back out there, and we'll get you right back in the mix, okay? And when the children of Ammon saw that they had made themselves odious to David, Hanan and the children of Ammon sent a thousand talents of silver to hire them chariots and horsemen out of 
Ammon Naharayim, and out of Aram Machka, and out of Zobah. So they hired them thirty and two thousand chariots, and the king of Maka and his people, who came and encamped before Medeba, and the children of Ammon gathered themselves together from their cities and came to battle. It was war. It was an act of war to send those men back ashamed. Okay? They had made themselves odious to David. And what is this term, odious? To be offensive. They were morally... They, they, they knew... The children of Ammon saw that they had made themselves... It comes from to smell bad, which is an offensive. And it's morally offensive. Okay? That, that they offend, offended David's religious morals. And so they knew it was war. That was an act of war. So they got ready for it. And then David heard of it, and he sent Joab and all the hosts of the mighty men. And the children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the gate of the city. And the kings that were come were by themselves in the field. Now when Joab saw that the battle was set against him before and behind, he chose all of the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Arameans. And the rest of the people he committed into the hand of Abishai, his brother, and they put themselves in array against the children of Ammon. And he said, If the Arameans be too strong for me, then you come back and help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for you, then I'm going to come help you. Be of good courage and let us prove strong for our people and for the cities of our God and the Lord, Yehovah. Do that which seemeth him good. So Joab and the people that were with him drew nigh, and they put all their faith in God. Okay, that's what that's saying. You know, we're, we're, we're on the side of righteousness. Just be strong and believe this. So Joab and the people that were with him drew nigh unto the battle to meet the Arameans, and the Arameans fled before him. And when the children of Ammon saw that the Arameans were fled, they likewise fled before Abishai his brother and entered into the city. Then Joab came to Jerusalem. And when the Arameans saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they sent messengers and brought out the Arameans that were beyond the river, and Shophak, the captain of the hosts of Hadrazar, at their head. And it was told David, and yet he gathered all Israel together and passed over the Jordan, and it came upon them and set the battle in array against them. So when David had put the battle in array against the Arameans, they fought with him. And the Arameans fled before Israel. And David slew of the Arameans, the men, 7,000 chariots, 40,000 footmen, and killed Shophak, the captain of the host. Now listen. When the children of Ammon in 19.5 saw that the Arameans were fled, the Arameans fled. Okay? Why? They were just hired. Hired guns. They weren't fighting for their land, for their king, for their work. They were paid to go to war, and they saw that, oh no, we ain't doing this, and they took off, okay? But these Israelites are fighting for the nation, and they're fighting, they have God, they believe that God is with them, and it's all, you know, it's like they're not gonna, they're not gonna run scared, okay? And so, so half these guys ran scared, and the other half... The Arameans fled before Israel, and David slew of the Arameans of the men 7,000 chariots, 40,000 footmen, and killed Shophak, the captain of the hosts. First Chronicles 19.19 19. And when the servants of Hadrazar saw that they were put to the worst before Israel, they made peace with David and served him. Neither would the Arameans help the children of Ammon any more. God promised him, and he's delivering. And David is conquering and conquering, and he has nothing to worry about. Okay? Now, these are just men. Okay? And it came to pass, Chronicles 21, at the time of the return of the year, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that Joab led forth the power of the army and wasted the country of the children of Ammon and came and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried at Jerusalem, and Joab smote Rabbah and overthrew it. And David took the crown of Malcolm from off his head and found it to weigh a talent of gold, and there were precious stones in it, and it was set upon David's head, and he brought forth the spoil of the city, a lot, exceeding much, more than a lot. And he brought forth the people that were therein, and cut them with saws, and with harrows of iron, and with axes, and thus did David unto all the cities of the children of Ammon, and David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. David was ruthless. You know, there's a reason a lot of people came and gave in, and when they gave in, they gave David money and tribute, because if when David beat you, he 
cut they cut them in half. He was cutting people in half. Okay, they were chopping heads off. Okay, they were no joke. War is no joke. Even if it's God's people, war is ugly. Okay. First Chronicles twenty four. Now it came to pass after this that there arose a war at Gezar with the Philistines. Then Sibachai the Hushatite slew Sippai of the sons of the giants, and they were subdued. What are these giants? Now the war is getting a little crazier, huh? This is the Nafa. These are the Rafa, I'm sorry, the Raphaim. Okay, Rafa from Raphaim. Okay, Nafa is the fallen angels, the Nephilim. The Raphaim are the hybrid offspring, okay, of, of the fallen angels. And this word Rafa is from Rafa to men, that is to cure, okay. But this is in the sense of an invigorating, okay, a giant, okay. The house of the giant is Beth Rafa, okay, the house of the giant, all right. So 7497 is Rafa, and these are giants, okay? These are these are huge guys. These are 8, 10, 12 foot guys, okay? And they were subdued, all right? 20 verse 5, And there was again a war with the Philistines, and Elanon, the son of Jer, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. So Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Lith the Lithite, the Gittite, he had a spear, okay, that the wood was like a beam, okay, like a weaver's beam, like a big pole, the weave, you know, when you're, when you're making textiles, you get these big beams that, that the, that the, that, that are on the loom, and it's huge, okay, so we're telling you, these are giants, these are big guys, okay, and let's look at, uh, uh, I want to see one word here, Gittite is just an inhabitant of Gath, but we know who Goliath was, Goliath was a giant, and Lami is the brother of Goliath, which means Lami is a giant, and his spear staff was like a weaver's beam, okay, the frame, the, like the frame of a loom, huge, okay, so the, 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 the enemy's getting bigger and stronger. And there was again a war at Gath, First Chronicles 20, verse 6. And there was a man of great stature, whose fingers and toes were four and twenty, six on each hand and six on each foot, and he also was born unto the giant. Okay? And he was born unto the giant, to the Rapha. Okay? And he had 24 digits. Now look, do your homework and go to every ancient mythology. Okay, do you know Pakal, the hybrid son of a god, the Mayan king? Okay, he was, his father was a god, his mother was a human, and Pakal was a hybrid. And he was normal looking, okay? But Pakal's son, and there's a picture of him on a pyramid, there's a glyph that I've seen with my own eyes that has him with six fingers. Six fingers on each hand, six toes. That he was a hybrid giant, okay? And now look, if you're the king, do you think for once that, that Pakal commissioned this artwork and the artist was like, you know what? As a joke, I'm just going to make six fingers on this guy. And forever this thing's going to stand. And I'll have, I'll have... No! He accurately portrayed the son of the king with six fingers. And he was a hybrid. And it stands to this day. Okay? And it's the Pyramid of the Steps. And there's four pillars on top of it. And it's a famous picture. And if you ever look at the one glyph, it's going to have... I'm going to try to find it. I need to try to put it here. Because you've got to see this. Six fingers. But do your own homework. And look, look through history on these giants with six fingers, six toes. Some of them even had two rows of teeth. Okay? This is real, people. This is real. 
And so David's like, man, the enemy's getting huge. But when he defied Israel, okay, the man of great stature, whose fingers and toes were four and twenty-six, and he also was the son of the giant, but when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, slew him. These were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fled the these were born unto the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So now they're even defeating the giants, okay? So David, you know, I don't know what David's thinking, but here in First Chronicles chapter twenty one, verse one. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. What does that mean? God promised David, you're, I'm gonna, you're going to subdue all your enemies. I'm going to be with you. You have nothing to worry about. Okay? And you're even going to, you're going to stay king. And when you die, your son, I'm going to raise up a kingdom forever. Eventually through Yeshua. But Solomon was to build the temple. Okay? Prophesied by Yehovah himself. Okay? Now David's paranoid. He's beating everybody and he's like, man, it's getting tough. I wonder how many soldiers I have because I want to make sure that we have enough soldiers. No, that is a sin. He is not to worry. It is what it is. It is what it is. Trust. You go out there with one guy and, and, and with God behind you, what did Elijah do? If I be a man of God, let fire come and smote all of you. And it happens because that's the power and that's the faith we need to have. When things are going good, you can't say, man, things are going good. What can I do to ensure that I continue prosperously? It's not about you. This is the doubt. Doubt is creeping in. David has been proven time and time again that the hand of God is with him and that the prophets are telling David things and David's answering through his prayers to God and he's communicating and he has a relationship with God and now look it. Satan's got him questioning God. You think you got enough guys, Dave? The giants are getting pretty big. Your, your enemies get more powerful. You think you got enough people? 1 Chronicles 21, verse 2, And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go, number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Go count all the soldiers we got. Count them all, because I want to know how many we got in case times get to... What is he thinking? What is he thinking? And Joab answered, Yehovah make his people a hundred times so many more as they were. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? David, what are you doing? This is a wrongdoing. This is a trespass. That you're, you're questioning our ability to fight. God has promised us, and Joab is saying that in certain words, okay? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Do what I said. Joab's like, man, this ain't right, Dave. You're bringing this trespass against us by questioning that God is going to deliver us from everybody, that we have many, many men, and we don't need to count them because we have God. But nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. The king's word overruled God's word. Okay? Wherefore Joab departed and went through all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. Do the math. That's millions. A million and a, a one million one hundred thousand. Okay? And Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew the sword. So Judah, four hundred threescore is four hundred and what is it? Sixty. So it's ten thousand four hundred and sixty men. And Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. Okay. Levi and Benjamin, especially the Levites or the priests, and he and he didn't count the Benjamites because the king's word was abominable to Joab. It was disgusting what he had him doing. Okay, 
He loathed it. He abhorred it. Joab was sort of pissed. Okay? And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing. But now put away, I beseech thee, the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. So now David's repenting. Because he knows he shouldn't have done this. And it was foolish of him to question his power against the world, given that God was with him. And it's foolish for us. I can't make it. How much money do I have in the bank? And how much, you know, am I... We need to put that away and we need to trust God that whatever happens, He's going to deliver us from what we need to be delivered. Hey, if you got a mortgage and it's upside down because you were selfish and you wanted a house you couldn't afford and you're about to lose that house, maybe God's putting some humility into you. Okay? But what if He's also called you to forsake everything and you're fighting it because you want your big house? Okay? Got to think about this, people. If God be with us, who be against us? God is in control. Trust Him every step of the way. And when you think it's not going your way, you better know it's going God's way. And like Job, He's, he's expecting you to stand like a warrior and take it and move forward with strength and, and honor and dignity and integrity. Not like, oh, I'm paranoid. What's going No. This is a sin. Okay? This is why we repent constantly for our doubts. Okay? I've done very foolishly to doubt God, to question God. 20 verse 9, And the Lord spoke unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, to God. God ain't even want to talk to David. Go and speak unto David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith Yehovah, I offer thee three things, choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. I'm going to give you one of three punishments, and you pick one. So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith Yehovah, take which thou wilt, either three years of famine, or three months to be swept away before thy foes, while the sword of thy enemies overtake thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord even pestilence in the land, and, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the borders of Israel. Now therefore consider that answer, and I shall return to him, he that sent me. This is deep, people. All right? Look at this. The sword of the Lord. Hold on. Let's go here. The sword of the Lord is the kareb. Okay? Also a cutting instrument. He who hath his sword can approach him in Job. Because they couldn't comprehend that. I'm, I'm sidetracking here, but this is important because you need to know. Here, the sword of the Lord is, and the angel of the Lord destroying. Okay? That's the sword of the Lord. The cherub, the cherub, is the sword of the Lord. The angel, the malak, is another word for the sword of the Lord. Okay? Destroying all the coasts of Israel. So you have the sword of the Lord, the cherub, and now you go to Job... Okay, this is how you have these connections, and you go to Job 40, okay? Behold, behemoth, he is the chief of the ways of God, and he that made him can make his sword, his kareb, a cutting instrument, the same word to approach him, and you have he in Rashith, he made in Rashith in the first creation, okay, the course, the mode of action, he, he is in the first mode of action, the behemoth of Elohim, of El, the Almighty, okay, the first world age, and he was made to be played with by the angels, okay, this is that word, and they say, well, because we don't believe in dinosaurs, we have to believe that this can't be like it is with Brenton in the uh, in the translation, he is the chief of the creation of the Lord, made to be played with by his angels. Is how that is translated, the sword, because it is an angel. It is a warrior angel. It is an angel so powerful that a Tyrannosaurus Rex would be like, "I'm out of here," and they would catch him and snare him. Look. 
Yet one shall take him in his sight, one shall catch him with a cord and pierce his nose. That behemoth, that dinosaur, that the Kareb, the warrior angel, would subdue that dinosaur. And this is the angel, the kind of angel, the rank of angel, that God is going to send in one of his wraths, should David choose it. Okay? Now I'm just telling you, when you read the word of God... It's all here for us to understand. The more we read, the more our mind is allowed to make these connections. And as long as we're reading in the English, they might just go right by us. But when you see, uh, or that the sword of the Lord and pestilence should be three days in the land, and the angel of the Lord shall be destroying all the inheritance of Israel, you got to know that angel is the sword of the Lord. And that sword is a cherub. Okay, It's a rank of angel. It's a rank of a created entity by Yahuwah. Okay? And now we're like, wow. This word of God is intense. If we, if we let it speak to us and we study it, however long it takes, we need to be in this word every day to make these connections. Okay? So, he's given a choice. Three years of famine. Okay? Or that thou shalt flee... Three months from the face of thine enemies, and the sword of thine enemies shall be employed to destroy thee, or that the sword of the Lord and pestilence should be three days in the land, and the angel of the Lord shall be destroying all the inheritance of Israel. And now consider what I shall answer to him that sent the message. Okay? Answer to him that sent the message. Who sent the message? Yahuwah. Okay? God said... Three days of his wrath is right on par with three years of no food or three months of getting your butt kicked by your enemies and having your people destroyed, okay, or three days of my angel. Take your pick. And that's a hard choice right now. Because either one, either dis any of these three choices means death to a lot of Israelites. In the amount of time that it takes to starve as many people in three years, those people can same amount of people could be killed by the sword in a more violent death, where one starvation is a slow and violent struggle. In three months, they could be violently chopped to pieces by their enemy, or in three days, an angel can just have at them and just destroy them with sores and and red bloody water that's poisonous and bitter and this is intense so David now David's got a choice to make because he's got to pick one of these three and if he doesn't pick any you know what he's going to get he's going to get the cherub of the Lord coming to destroy okay with pestilence and this word pestilence okay everybody think pestilence is like a disease because they don't know any better but this word pestilence is a destruction. Okay? Deber. Okay? Deber. It's to it's an arranged it it's it's subduction to subdue in a sense of destroying. Okay? Yeah, you can consider it a plague, could be one way, but this is a destruction. Okay? The, that in three days I can destroy as many in three days as as many would die in three years by starvation or as many would die in three months of siege. Three months. Okay? Thousands and thousands a day being destroyed by an army that just has its way because God has taken his, his protective uh, covering away from the Israelites. So Satan has got Satan's got David in a jam right now, okay? Because David thought he could get a little paranoid after God had delivered him out of the hands of giants, okay? But he got a little scared. He said, the enemy's getting bigger and tougher. How many, because what's next? How many do I got? And that was, that, at this point, was his downfall to this moment, okay? So, First Chronicles twenty-one thirteen, And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. I, I got my back to the wall. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies, and let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel seventy thousand men. And God sent so so basically he's saying is 
I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. He chose the angel of the Lord. He said, let God do it to me. He said, I blew it. I don't want to go through three years. I don't want nobody else to mess with me. I don't want it to be some king coming in having his way with me. Let God give me his punishment. I did this to God. Let me fess up and let God have his way. So the Lord sent a pestilence, a destruction upon Israel. And there fell of Israel 70,000 men immediately. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was about to destroy it, the Lord Yahweh beheld. And he repented of him of the evil and said to the destroying angel, It is enough. Now stay thy hand. And the angel of the Lord, this cherub, this sword of the Lord who was sent, was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Okay, Then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. And David said unto Elohim, is it not that I commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and have done very wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thy hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house, but not against thy people, that they should be plagued. And the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David, that David should go up, and rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spoke in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons that were with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David, and went out of the threshing floor, and bowed down to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Give me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build thereon an altar unto the Lord. For the full price shalt thou give it me, that the plague may be stayed from thy people. Okay. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let thy lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee the oxen for burnt offerings, and the threshing instruments for wood, and the wheat for the meal offering. I give it all. And, the, and King David said to Ornan, No, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, for Jehovah, nor offer a burnt offering without cost. So David gave to Ornan for the place six hundred shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto Jehovah, and a burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon Jehovah. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And Jehovah commanded the angel, and he put his sword back into the sheet thereof. At the time when David saw that the Lord had answered him in the threshing floor of Orn and the Jebusite when he sacrificed there, for the tabernacle of the Lord which Moses made in the wilderness and the altar of burnt offering there at the time of the high place at Gibeon, but David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was terrified because of the sword of the angel of the Lord. So, so David, you know, when we, when we make a decision to disobey God and something happens to us as a result of it, you got to just take it, okay? There is a consequence for disobedience. And, and, and there's verses that say, I mean, he... He only chastises those he loves. Okay, it's the bad ones that get away with everything and keep getting away with everything. But you have to be put in your place so that you can reflect on your behavior and your sense of obedience or lack of obedience to the Lord and what he would have you do in these last days. Okay, now... You know, I got a little sidetracked with that, the sword of the Lord and the dinosaurs and stuff. But I just wanted to be clear that that sword of the Lord, those are destroying angels. 
those Kurubs, okay? Those are destroying angels, and they come, and, and, and they will come. And they have come, and they have lived in the past, and they did. They did commune with the dinosaurs. Okay, that's a whole other. That's a whole other story. But I think what I'm talking about right here, what this story is about, is that if you're not obedient, you you have to know that God isn't always going to send a prophet to you because He sent a prophet to you. Okay, He sent a messenger to you. To tell you what's expected of you. Okay? Many of them. is documented in these books. Okay? So you have been warned. Because you've been instructed to put this word first. Okay? And you have the information here. So if you refuse to obey this information. Trouble may come upon you. Because you need to be put in place. You need to be put in check. Okay, do you think you can go out to the street corner and shoot somebody in the head in broad daylight and nothing's going to happen to you? Society has put the law out. You chose to break the law. There is a punishment. Okay? And so our lack of obedience... Oh, why is God punishing me? No. What, did I, what am I doing? Why am I not... What am I to gain from this? How has Satan gotten into my world and convinced me that my behavior was acceptable or not acceptable to God to have me behaving in such a way that I will disobey God and have to suffer the consequences? You know? Look, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And if it was easy, it, it wouldn't be worth anything. Okay? We're asking for eternity. We're asking for eternal salvation. We're, 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 we're repenting to ensure our eternity with Yeshua and the Father. Okay? Men would pay billions of dollars to live 150, 200 years if they could. What would we pay? To live for eternity. And we have to pay with our souls. We have to pay with our conviction. And we have to pay with our behavior. Every day. That we know what's at stake. And that it is worthy of reflection. It's worthy of content repentance. Okay. To live in a constant state of reverence. Of fear. Of not, not any of these human beings. That will take you and, and kill you in the first death. But fear that. That will that is powerful and can offer the second death and from that second death there there is no escape once that has been put on you okay at least we know that if we're in the way and we're following this word okay and we put the the habitual sin away and now we're dealing with sins of the mind and sins of the mouth and sins of the heart sins of doubt okay like David doubting God okay repent as David here, he repents. He sees what's happening and he's repenting. He's like, what can I do? What can I offer? Well, what can you offer? You can offer your time. You can offer your finances. You can offer your clothing. You can offer the food off your shelf. You can offer your, 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 yourself. Okay? Make an offering to God and move forward. Okay? Repent. Do something that God would have you see as a sacrifice. Okay, fasting. Okay, offer your hunger to the Lord. Okay, there's many ways to move through these, these, these events in life. Am, am I justifying sin? No, what I'm saying is we're all sinners. Okay, but put the easy stuff away because it just gets harder when, when you're not drunk, when you're not fornicating, when you're not... Um, conniving and, and stealing and, and trying to figure out how to take your neighbor's money. Okay? Now we're, now we're fighting with Satan on, am I going to, do I really have salvation? Is God really going to provide for me? Are, are all my needs really going to be met? God will give you what you need, no more, no less. And if you don't get what you want, it's probably what you don't need. Okay? So, I love you guys. The devil's no joke. I mean, even somebody who's in a communi 
communication with the Lord, who had benefited from the Lord, became the king, who was conquering and conquering and conquering, Satan got in his business and had him questioning God. And we can't do that. We can't allow that. Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? I love you guys and I pray for you guys. You know, I pray for myself. I pray for all of us that we have the strength and courage. You know, Heavenly Father, I pray that that we just see the beauty in your words and that we accept the, accept the good and the bad. And that it's hard. The harshness, the severity of, of, of your love for us is no joke. And that we understand that that you, you will punish us if we step out of line and that and that we need to repent and we need to offer ourselves up as a sacrifice to you father and live for you to make it right we love you and we pray for your forgiveness and your grace and we pray for strength and wisdom and courage to have the faith to walk in these last days knowing satan is attacking us and knowing satan would have nothing more than to have us slip and fall and doubt you and doubt your love for us, Father. We pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach and the Ruach HaKadosh. Amen. Peace. I love you.